All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to talk about agile infrastructure. It may or may not seem interesting right now. Hopefully, by the end of it, you'll have questions, maybe not answers, about what agile and infrastructure are and what they have to do with each other. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself. I'm Andrew. I was a developer once upon a time. I've been a member of several Agile teams. I'm tolerated at the Salt Lake Agile Roundtable quite frequently. <laughs> I mostly work for startups. I'm the founding partner of a, a new startup called Reductive Labs. And I'm an all-around troublemaker. And the rest is complicated, but that's probably enough to uh, keep going with this story. Oh, yeah. There's always a duck. So, so what is Agile, right? What is Agile? Who knows what Agile is? Who thinks software development is a solved problem? So we have this manifesto. The manifesto has four values and 12 principles. And if you really sit and, and reflect on the, the people that were at Snowbird and the influence and the impact that they've had on our industry, both past, present, and future, then you, you just have to be amazed at, at the, the movement, right? The Agile movement. And while we talked about earlier, you know, maybe Agile hasn't crossed the chasm, but the word has, there's still a lot there. There's a lot of benefit that, that people are getting from these, this meeting, this, this meeting of minds and this idea. So, but what is Agile? What does it really mean? The way I see it, I kind of break it in, in my own understanding into kind of two camps. And you basically have Agile practices that help you plan and predict, and then Agile practices that are sort of engineering and developer-centric. And if you sort of reflect on the manifesto that was signed and, and those people that were there, then, then most of them were, were developers, had a background as a developer, right? So sort of developer-centric. And you got to have someone who makes decisions about what features you're going to do, and, and you might want to you know, make sure they're the, that they're working before you deliver the software. But then there's this whole list of things, and, and you, know, you heard in some talks earlier, it's like the executives and the leaders don't even know what their role is anymore. And they're trying to figure this thing out, and it's, it's are we doing Agile, or is Agile doing us? We don't really know. And the, there's sort of this, uh, you know, the, all these little tribes, and you, know, you can't even start talking about sales guys and marketing, like it just breaks down, right? So we kind of have this little circle of happiness. And people are talking about, and there's lots of good ideas. I know lots of people here have strong ideas and, and, and implementable solutions to you know, executives. And um, you know, there's some ambler stuff on databases. And, and there's these different things. But there's sort of this central thing. And then, and then over here, there's, there's this other stuff, right? That <laughs> people, you know, it's, it's, we want to be agile. And we talk about being agile everywhere. But we're not always sure how to do it, right? And you, you, gotta, you can't be too careful with who you let into the circle of happiness. So if you look at the timeline and the time frame, when, when the manifesto was signed, it was sort of the rise of, of this client-server architecture, right? So, so at that point, you had most software being shipped on CD. So you would go to the store, and you'd buy a CD, and you'd install it, and it would work. And at the other end of that, you have all these support cost because it has to work on every version of Windows. It has to work on all this stuff and you know you have to manage all this sort of complexity on the other side of things. And then we've kind of moved more to, to a server-centric architecture where now you, you, you're managing those servers and, and those applications are developed on those servers, but that creates its own complexity. So I want to kind of know um, just in general whose company works on web applications? Who makes web applications? So I'd say 60, 70 percent, is that fair? So we're kind of moving, you can still go to you know, Walmart or whatever and you can buy some applications in shrink wrap, but for the most part, everything is going to be downloaded, right? We're getting to the app store age. Everything is going to be kind of streamed in bits and then it, it might still have an installer, but it's no longer going to be shipped. So there's this whole chain, there's this chain of kind of delivering value is shifting and, and in most cases there's all sorts of transformations that are kind of happening right now and I don't I don't get into the hype of, of some of the words too much but there's definitely a change in the way infrastructure can be deployed and, and what I'm doing what my personal work is, is kind of a big part of that at least I like to think so so who's working on a web app where's that web app run 
who takes care of the servers? How do you interact with them? <laughs> Is them people or servers? <laughs> right? So I want to kind of step back and talk about agile practices, because I, I, I talked at the beginning, there's sort of engineering and planning practices. So if we step back to what most people consider the, the developer-centric engineering practices that are agile, in my mind, they all start with these two things, version control and building from source. Until you can do that, you can't really do anything else. Does anyone disagree with that? I mean, it's essentially once, it, you, you can't think about TDD, you can't think about continuous integration. All, this is the first step to being able to embark on, on the best practices of, of agile development from an engineering perspective. So who version controls the configurations for their, for their servers? And, and who can automatically rebuild systems? If, yeah. So there's this project that my company makes called Puppet. And what Puppet allows you to do is encode this infrastructure to encode the server configurations in a declarative way. And code has semantics. If you're a developer and you work on code, it's, it's come up a couple times. It's a theme. And it's, the, it's the what versus why. Semantics give you, it can give you why. It can be recovered. And this code it can be reproduced so you can rebuild those servers. It's more maintainable. It's more extensible, it's shareable, and some people are using it. Okay, so this kind of gives you an idea about the, the type of organizations that can take advantage of this. Anyone can take advantage of it because it is free and open source software. So it, it allows you to, at very low cost, do some things that you, you probably aren't thinking about doing today, potentially. I know we only got a couple of sysadmins, but. So I'll try to explain it a little better because it's a mixed audience and I want this to, to kind of make sense to the product manager and the executive and everyone else. So if you kind of use the traditional approach to managing servers and systems, then the chance, it, it, say, say you had a web app and you have some web servers and some database servers, the chance that those servers are all configured identically gets pretty small pretty fast using traditional methods. And why? Well, going back to my hero Brian Merrick said this morning, basically a lot of places, the sysadmins, they're, they're taxed to the limit. They have this backlog of requests they can't quite get to, and if, if something goes down, there's not really documentation, you're, you know, oh, there's this package, and there's this configuration, and you, you try to do it, you, you might have some scripts, but, oh, the, you know, the version of the operating system changed, or that package is upgraded, and you're not maintaining private repos, and there's this, all this kind of technical stuff that gets, gets in the way, and, and it's, uh, I don't know, I, I think the, the, is everyone familiar with the term yak shaving? You basically end up shaving yaks, and these, these kind of inconsistencies cause all sorts of problems. They have, they have real costs, and if you're having any success at all with your application, there's more and more and more servers. There's going to be more servers, right? So you're running as a sysadmin from the brightest fire to the brightest fire, and the chances are that the server that's working that isn't configured exactly like the server next to it that is also working is going to get any attention. It's going to get zero attention, right? This is a shout out to Brother at Arms. So I used to work. <laughs> I used to work for a, a company that had a, kind of a SaaS online e-commerce uh, thing, and, and if there's an outage, like it really impacts the company. It's every second you're down is dollars, and it impacts not just the sysadmin who has the pager who's scrambling to try to figure out what's wrong and get it up, but it's also the support guy. It sucks in all the things, you know, the executives just watching the money kind of go, and it's not fun, and that just makes the problem worse, right? Because now you have another fire, the brightest fire. So what does that really mean? Well, deployments and upgrades tend to be expensive, tedious, and error prone in, in most organizations. And that's because there's a lot of manual steps involved. There's a lot of babysitting. There's a lot of tending. I see the sis out of me shaking his head. Can I get a hallelujah? No, I'm just kidding. So who, who's as a tester has ever run into a problem when they're testing an application that the test servers are not configured like the production servers, therefore something didn't work or did work, and then when you get on the other environment, it works, 
And it's just, it's great, right? Like, that gets, you can spend like whole days dealing with that. Who, who's ever had that situation? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, there's staging, you can, there's all these kind of things you can put into the workflow to, to make this. Um, another thing that happens, if you can't rebuild your servers from source, then if a server goes down, you're in a world of hurt, especially if that's a critical system. So one of the things that we kind of get, we try to think about when we're building systems that are redundant and scalable, is you should be able to take any box and throw it out the window. And if you can recover from that in, in zero time or, or in you know, some allowable, based on the criticality of your system, amount of time, then that's a good test. And when you start thinking about, okay, like, we have these unstable servers, and if we touch them and they go down, then it starts to make sense that you need sign-off, and you want, to, you want to slow down and kind of control the pace of change on these systems. And so things like, you know, a, a ticket system that has to be signed off, and this very, very heavyweight change control process starts to seem like a really, really good idea. And oh yeah, you're having some success, so there's going to be more and more and more servers to manage. And now, we're going to talk about virtual machines. So, we also have this, this kind of new stuff. It's, it's been around for a while, but it's just really starting to, to take hold. And you know, some people talk about the cloud, the cloud clouds, and they argue about all this stuff. And it's just like arguing about Scrum versus XP. It's kind of stupid. But what it allows you to do is, is take it even a step farther. So now your infrastructure is even more encoded, potentially, because with an API call, you can launch new machines, where previous, the, the kind of previous MO is if you needed more capacity, then you had to get a, a purchase order, and you had to send it off, and then three weeks later you get machines, and then there's guys with CDs, or if you're, you know, maybe pixie booting or whatever, and so now you have some systems, and then you got to configure them all, and now you have your new servers, but they're, they're not configured just like the servers that they were supposed to be identical to because, well, all the problems we already mentioned. But now you can bring up servers in minutes with API calls. You know, EC2, you can have, you know, VMware, ESX, Zen, whatever, in-house, and you can set up all sorts of infrastructure that in minutes you can have new machines. And those, those machines can be used to do things like be your production environment, but those could also be test and dev environments. So you can do a lot of, of interesting things that you can't really do if you're using traditional methods right now. But it could also be, you know, the development environment. How many people, when they hire a new developer or a new tester or whatever, have, have uh, can kind of out of the box give them the, the environment that they need configured, or, or how much time does that kind of waste on the front end of bringing a new guy in? So there's more and more machines. Some people like to think about making kind of images of all the different systems that you have, and, and so then you start out thinking, okay, well, I'm going to have a database, I'm going to have this, and then pretty soon you have like eight different images, and then you got to deal with change management, all this stuff, and it's it's just image all over the place, and I guarantee you, it's not as good as what we do because you don't have any semantics. You can't look inside. Once you save that image, it's, it's 500 megabytes of opacity and you don't know what's in there. You might have made notes that this is the, the server that does this or that, but at the end of the day, you don't know until you start it up and then you, know, then you have, basically you, you've kind of minimized and collapsed some of your hardware problems because you can run 10 machines on one hardware, but you have 10 times more machines to configure now. So the problems that we were talking about before are getting multiplied, the configuration problems. And what are you gonna do, right? Like, you have no idea how to manage those, but that's, uh, that's supposed to be fun. <laughs> so infrastructure is code. And we're kind of talking about the, the uh, engineering side of things still. So my advice, as much as possible, automate everything. And I think there's a lot of strong parallels and sort of this approach to building infrastructure and, and automated testing in kind of the tester side of things. So it's basically tools uh, or, or you know, infrastructure and tools that give you, uh, open up new possibilities for how you can do stuff. I mean, we talk about the manifesto and, and we say that we value over tools and process, but who, who can build agile code without uh, a unit framework, a test unit framework? You, you need to have these kind of processes and tools to make the individuals and interactions even work, right? So we want to get more done, spend less time doing it, hopefully we can put out the fires, and we want to use our, our humans who are smart and we pay them a lot of money to make decisions, and then we want to let frameworks do all the work. And that, that's kind of what we're going for. So what it allows you to do, and this is why some of the, the big companies like this approach, is it kind of collapses the aspect of scale. And if you ask my partner, who, who did a lot of the work and most of the work to kind of pioneer this approach, 
If you ask him what, what machine should you, should you use this on, he'll tell you it's just like flossing your teeth. You should only do it on the ones you want to keep. Right? So, <laughs> so what it allows us to do is take advantage of these processes and tools. And because it's code now, you can apply all the, the knowledge that you guys are basically kind of growing and spreading and sharing <coughs> that we use for software development to build our, imp, our, our infrastructure. So it's code, you can diff it, you can you know, put in version control, you can blame, you can do all the stuff that we do in code with the same process. And that, that's going to have some implications for planning that we're going to look at in just a second. But there's going to be more and more servers, I pretty much guarantee that, and this gives you a way to get that handle on that. So now I'm going to kind of transition. Um, one of the things that we, in our work when we're, when we're going in and, and we see organizations, and this, this is, has a lot of parallels with Agile in general, but people can only change if they want to, right? And you can talk all you want about, about tools and about Agile and about all this stuff, but if someone doesn't want to change, they're not going to, right? So when, when you get to the heart of the matter, it's not necessarily a technology problem in a lot of organizations. It's a human engineering problem. It's a social engineering problem. You have to get people to believe. You have to get people to understand and be motivated. And, and I think that these kind of core principles of the manifesto are, are the key to doing that. So, so building communication, building collaboration. And it's also because now you, you have code and you've hopefully put out those brightest fires, you, you can come out of that firefighting mode and you can get much more predictable estimation and, and prioritization of the infrastructure that you need to build. So who, who's heard the term non-functional requirements? What does that mean? Right? <laughs> So I always hear people say non-functional requirements, and then I'm like, well, if you don't do that, then it won't work at all, right? So you have to do that, because when it comes right down to it, requirements are requirements, and if you're building a web app, it is the infrastructure. You, you got rid of the problem of shipping CDs and having to support it on every single platform that you're going to, but now you have one platform, and it's yours, and you got to take care of it. And if you don't, then you don't have an application. And that's the bottom line. So without infrastructure, without keeping this stuff going, there's no app. And not only that, but say you have a successful app and you're, and you're having more, more success and people are using it. And what happens now? Well, the stuff that worked when you had 10 servers doesn't work when you have 100 servers. And you have to analyze how this stuff's going down into those you know, databases and hitting files, and that requires a deep understanding of both the application and the, and the infrastructure. And if you don't have that kind of collaboration and meeting of the minds between the dev and the ops, then you're gonna have a hard time solving these problems and, and really, you know, scaling this to whatever, you know, your aspirations might be. So, we're gonna talk about some people. And we already talked about, you know, there's, there's only us, and that, that's sort of a theme that I, I keep getting, you know, going back and, talking to Alistair and kind of getting his thoughts on it, but when you, when you think about the, the different uh, roles and personas that are building um, applications, you know, the, the developers are kind of outside the circle, or the operation guys are kind of outside the circle of happiness of the developers in most cases. So, so there's sort of this, this inherent problem communicating, right? And, and, and going back to what we talked about a minute ago, there, there's potentially this heavyweight change control process that's been put in place to protect us from ourselves, right? So pretty soon, people aren't very happy because you know the developers don't understand why the operations guys make the decisions they do. The operations guys carry pagers, and they don't understand why the developers keep writing bad SQL queries. And <laughs> it's funny because it's true. And so they have this kind of heavy process, and, and they, they don't really talk to each other, and they, they enter tickets, and then Pretty soon, people are even more upset about how the things work, and it just it, it's a bad scene. And you can see, I and mean, this is kind of the point I was trying to make in the uh, "There's Only Us," but you, you can see this sort of wall of confusion between other roles in, in other cases. And, and there's there's sort of these ways that you can think about breaking them down. And, and one of the the favorite, uh, or one of the things that I, I found particularly insightful is an essay by by Brian Merrick, who was here talking earlier about about boundary objects. And it's basically creating the, these things that both sides can kind of see. And he talks about the, these communities of practice 
and these communities of interest. So, so in, in this case, we have developers who are a community of practice, and we have operations who are a community of, of practice, but, but together they're a community of interest. And, and really, you can't deliver the business value of your organization unless you are sort of this unified uh, community of interest. And as we already talked about, the app and the infrastructure are intimately tied together. So you, you need to maintain or, or establish these. You don't need to. But the alternative is to spend a lot of money and throw a lot of people at the problem and always be on fire. So that makes people happy, hopefully. And that's a great uh, essay. It's very short, but read uh, the, the Boundary Objects PDF. I, I think that there's a lot of, you can take those and you can apply those to lots of other places in, in an organization where you have breakdowns of communication between you know, whatever the, the developers, um, testers, developers, product managers, developers, executives, whatever, if you can figure out some sort of shared metaphor or some boundary object, then I think you can solve a lot of problems. And in, in some of our clients and, and some of the people that we're working with, what, what, what happens is the, the, the code that describes the infrastructure is this boundary object. It allows people on both sides to see things from not necessarily the same perspective. And, and some conflict's good, right, because it allows you to kind of optimize worldviews. But what it allows them to do is, is look at the same thing, have the same information about it. And so because of that, in some of these organizations, what their processes evolve to is that when developers write an application, instead of just like throwing it over the wall of confusion and hoping it lands on the servers and works, what they do is, is the developers are actually responsible for writing the, the puppet code that will configure that application. Right? So that's a boundary object that gets passed back and forth. And if the, if the application is not being configured correctly, then, then that's, a, that's a bug. And that, that can kind of go back into the, the normal flow of software development. And, and because it's an application, you can put it through the normal cycle uh, of dev, test, and prod. And so by the time it gets to your production servers, your test servers are already, already configured the same way. And you, and you just apply uh, a lot of the same things. So this is kind of the takeaway on, on the planning side. So you can plan for, for infrastructure requirements, but be willing and able to change them. And because you, you can encode them, and you have the flexibility of that, plus, coupled with, with the virtualization, you can do a lot of experiments with your, with your infrastructure that you couldn't do if you needed a purchase order and, and you know, weeks to get it. So you can bring up instances of EC2 and get experiments on, on the platform you're trying to run, with the applications you're trying to run, and get a lot of feedback. And I think that's, that's another thing that, that Agile, in my mind, sort of built on is these, these tight feedback loops and being able to feed that back into itself. So be willing to change them, be able to change them. And, and this is, so, so going, this kind of the, I'm stepping through the, the principles and values a little bit. So the operations, in my mind, their customer is the application. Their customer is the developer. So they, they need to be able to kind of have that, that same dialogue with the, with the developers in, in, in some sense as the, like the product managers would have with the, with the application. And if your infrastructure isn't working, nothing is. So if you're talking about shipping working software, that's, that's kind of the baseline, right? You need to have the lights on, on on the servers or else you got nothing. And of course, create a culture of collaboration. That's something that we've been hearing over and over. There's only us, there's only us, there's only us, and together we're going to ship some software. And then I edit this a little bit, so we want to take advantage of the processing tools we have for software development. And I crossed that out, and I went individuals interactions, but then after we had our little talk earlier, I decided that it was better to just go to interactions. So, so the most important statement from the manifesto, and this is kind of the takeaway. So I, I have a, a particular work I'm doing on, it's interesting to me, I have passion about it, and, and I want to help people, and I feel like I am. But I also, you know, you guys maybe aren't in that role to, to kind of see this, so I want to give you a takeaway that's sort of generic, and you guys can do whatever you need with it, whatever you want with it. So the most important statement, it, it might not be the values, and, and it might not be the principles, but the way that the manifesto starts, in my mind, is maybe the most important statement. So we're uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others to do it. Keep on covering. I'm Andrew. Uh, you know, uh, 
you know, automatically converting existing data into new data structures and that kind of thing, or is it is this completely infrastructure only? So the question is, will this help you with the age-old problem uh, of essentially mapping data from some old, older data structure into some new data structure that can be consumed? And the answer is no. Uh, it, it's not really, what is, what is resources, so, so what Puppet provides is, is sort of this abstraction layer with the resources that a system administrator would use. And those resources are abstractions for users, abstractions for groups, abstractions for packages, abstractions for mail points. All the kind of things that the sysadmin kind of thinks about in his head, and he has to remember on one platform, I type you know, this, and on the other platform, I type this, so it's RPM over here, and then it's, it's apt over here, and they kind of keep all this stuff straight in their head. Those are the things they're abstracting. It's not gonna help you map data. Um, it, it can help you move files around, but it's not going to help you transform data. What is the meat cloud anyway? The meat cloud. Oh, so uh, he asked, what is the meat cloud? And that's, uh, that's a loaded question. Okay. But uh, I wrote a blog post a while ago, uh, over a year ago now, talking about just these different terms and, and kind of, when we went to dinner the other night, we went to dinner last night with some of the speakers, and, and something Jeff Patton said kind of stick in my head for a while, and that is you, you, nothing exists until you have a word to describe it. And he was talking about kind of lean and Kanban and how, how you do all this stuff, but then until you kind of reframe it with these other words, then, then you don't necessarily understand it doesn't exist for you. And, and so from there, I, I was you know, watching all the stuff that's happening with clouds and watching all the stuff that's happening, and meet cloud is basically my term that I came up with for the way that kind of throwing bodies at the problem. To, like, you, you have like this line of, of servers you, you need to scale up and you just keep buying more guys, right? Instead of, instead of figuring out how to, how to do it better, you, you buy more guys. And that, that's the way I've been using it a lot. But in, in like a generic thing, I think of the meat cloud as sort of like all people doing sort of tedious anonymizing work, right? So, so anytime you, you have people doing something that could be automated and probably should be automated, that's a meat cloud. Carl. Yeah, um, this is kind of about, it's more of a comment than a question, but when you were saying that you think that uh, tools are still necessary, <coughs> you know, people are important according to manifest and all that, I think a, a pretty good argument could be made for the fact that the tools you're talking about are not necessarily individual tools. They're more like um, just techniques, patterns that are applied in a lot of different ways. There's more than one kind of version of Puppet out there that can be used. And I, so I think, I think there's still a lot of value in what you're saying. Um, this is more than just tools that you're talking about. These, these are techniques, these are patterns. I totally agree. So, so the comment is that the, it's more than just tools. It's about techniques and patterns. And, and for example, there's other, there's other projects that, are, that try to do something similar to Puppet. And it's all, it's all kind of about uh, what your philosophy is and, and what side of, of certain decisions you want to want to be on, and then there's also um, so one of the things Puppet is is only supported right now on Unix-based platforms. So if you have Windows, then a lot of this stuff it, it will eventually because because it's becoming apparent at least uh, to me that this is a superior way to manage systems. But that's why I do all that, and, <laughs> and and so I think that, that those gaps will get filled in in, in Windows. But, but right now, like if you are managing Windows infrastructure. You have other tools, but you don't have this particular approach to solve the problem. It's interesting, like, you look at the continuum of Ant, DA, then, then something like Puppet, where you're increasingly you know, doing larger and larger scales on the issue. Well, so that, that brings up an interesting point. And, and I think what you, so, so the question is when you're talking about automation, and, and he brought up Ant, which is a build tool if you're doing Java stuff, I'm sure you know. Um, and then Maven, which is kind of a, a higher level abstraction um, to try to do some of the same thing. And then Puppet, and, and in some ways, I agree with you, on some, on some level I think they're sort of orthogonal. They're solving different problems. Where, where one is building the, the application code and one is building the infrastructure code. And maybe at some point they, they will kind of uh, weave together. And, and I think that that might be coming faster than we realize. But for now, I, I think there's some orthogonality. I like a lot of what you're saying, so I really love the, the, the presentation. Uh, one other factor that comes into play for us is we introduce Agile, and uh, we're delivering much faster. So now we're, we're delivering releases 
uh, well, with multiple teams, potentially daily operations, Absolutely. And, and to watch operations go through this, you, you can see their heads exploding. So that's a good point. That's something that I didn't, I didn't really explore as fully as I, I maybe could. There, there's, there's a couple approaches to this, and, and there's sort of a spectrum. And I think it has to do with, with what your application is and, and how critical it is and what you're actually delivering. But there's, a, I think it's IMVU. There's an article that came out about this lean startup stuff. Has anyone been reading that? Does anyone know? So I'll, I'll explain what they did. They, they decided that they're just going to get rid of testers, basically. And so they, they automate it to the point where when you, when you commit code to the version control and it passes the continuing integration, it's automatically deployed. So they deploy 50 times a day. Right? Now, that works for them. And, and when, when I first heard it and you kind of saw this backlash from the testing community, if you really, anal really analyze their business and what they're delivering, they're delivering avatars for chat. Okay? And that's great. And they built a business and they made some money. But at the end of the day, the worst case scenario, if you have a, a bad deploy, if you will, is someone can't chat for 20 minutes or however long it takes you to fix that, get it back, or revert it, or, or roll it forward, or whatever. So if, if you try to apply that same mentality to, to like a live critical system or, or something, I, th I think there's a middle ground. There's a spectrum. And I think it goes back to design, too. Like there's an analogy in design when people talk about uh, you're not going to need it and, and do it at the last responsible moment. Well, in some cases, for some of these applications, the last responsible moment was six months ago, right? So when you start talking about, okay, well, we're not going to test. Well, what, what's the responsible level of testing for the critical nature of your app? And if you're doing chat avatars, it might be none, right? Anything else? So we're, uh, we can take a break. I can switch hats. <laughs> Welcome to Agile Roots. <laughs> no, we're uh, scheduled for a break in four minutes, and there was five minutes of, of slush time, so we're basically right on time. And there's a half an hour break, then we have some tutorials, it should be good. Everyone's invited to the social. There's gonna be food, and there's gonna be conversation. The, the format's gonna be uh, ask the experts, and that means anyone who wants to be an expert can be. Uh, so you can kind of take a, a table and say, I want to talk about this. Um, it, it's not quite open spaces or facilitated, but if you want to have a conversation about a certain thing, just put up a little sign, and we'll, we'll talk about that, and we're going to mix around, and maybe by the end of the night we'll play werewolf. Any questions? All right, have a break, and then we'll see you guys back in 30 minutes.